Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we are planting some pansies to add color into the winter garden. Wes Lee shares about our Oklahoma winds this past season. David Hillock is talking coleus. And before the garden starts to shut down, I'll show you a couple of vincas you might want to consider next year. And finally, Jessica Riggin is making bruschetta. We're back here in our All America Selection Annual Display Garden and one of the things I always like doing at the end of the season is to kind of showcase some of the annuals that have done really well. Well today I want to look at the vincas that we have here, um, also known as the periwinkles. Periwinkles have long been in the home landscape with their pinwheel flower that is just a traditional look, a classic look that we often see in the landscape. But these particular annuals that I want to highlight today are in the Mega Bloom series. Um, and so this particular one here in front of me, you can see it has that traditional periwinkle look where it's got kind of that pinwheel floral display and the white eye to the center of it. This one is actually known as the Orchid Halo as part of that Mega Bloom series. There's also a um, pink halo, which has a softer pink color to it and also the white eye to it as well. Now, if you wanna go with an even more classic look, there is one called polka dot that has your traditional white flower. And it almost looks like somebody's gone around with a paintbrush counting the flowers as each center has just a drop of hot pink right in the center of it, really attracting those pollinators to the center of that flower. Now each one of them are a couple of inches wide. So that's really what sets this um, Mega Bloom series apart from some of your traditional periwinkles is the fact that they are such large flowers and that they are held up on a very compact, tidy plant as well. So you don't have to worry about them flopping, but they're gonna continue to provide flowers throughout the season. One of the other things that this series has really been bred for also is heat and humidity tolerance, which as you know, we live in Oklahoma and we are well familiar with heat and humidity. So it's nice to have an annual that's gonna be able to handle that. And as you can see later in the season, um, it is still disease and pest free. And so we're doing good there. It does attract plenty of pollinators. We've got a lot of stuff flying around us right now. So if you're looking to add a periwinkle into your garden and wanna put a twist on an old face, Favorite, try looking at the Mega Bloom series that comes in this orchid halo, pink halo, or polka dot. It's time to plant our fall garden, and we're not just talking about cool season crops. You might remember that earlier we planted the inside of our potager garden with some. Uh, cool season vegetable crops, but that doesn't mean that the garden still can't be pretty. So we're going to add some color. Now, traditionally, I sort of am biased to perennials, but if there's one annual that deserves some attention in the garden, that is pansies, because there's not a lot of options for fall and winter color. Um, and these annuals will get established in the fall and they will continue to perform for you all the way until it's time to plant the garden again next spring. So we have some pansies here and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about color and design with pansies. Um, so in a previous life of mine, I used to do commercial landscaping and we design homeowners associations, resorts, and some large shopping centers with different uh, winter annual color down in Dallas. And so one of the things is we often were designing for traffic that was going very quickly past. So we kind of, de we designed it for 45 mile an hour traffic. 
they weren't up close they were usually in their cars but we wanted to have that impact of color at the corners and stuff so when we did that we were always thinking about bright bold colors so if you're looking to put um, winter color somewhere where it's a high traffic area think about that so we tended to use bright colors like yellows or some of your lighter colors like oranges and whites there's a citrus mix that I love, and it was a combination between yellow, white, and orange. So it's just a really vibrant color. Now, the other thing that we often thought about, you know, a lot of times people think of pansies and it's that classic face that you get on pansies that everybody loves. But if we're designing for an audience that's going really fast and not really up close to it, then that face is actually more of a detraction and it gives you less impact, less color. So if you're, again, designing for something where it's gonna be seen from afar um, and seen quickly, think about that and you might go with what they call clear pansies that don't have the face to it. So here we've got clear yellow and clear blue or azure blue um, pansies. The other thing to think about with pansies is the color white. Well, you know, white is a really good highlighter, especially for some of these other colors to mix that white in, it just kind of highlights the darker colors. Again, those darker colors, if you plant them in mass, a lot of times in the winter time, they sort of just kind of blend in with our soil. So by having that white in there, again, it creates that contrast. Now personally, and this is just a personal note, I'm not a big fan of just doing large beds of the clear white pansies because we get a lot of precipitation in the winter time. And when we have precipitation on these pansies, you can see how delicate they are. It sort of looks like your landscape might've got toilet paper. So I personally am not a fan of just doing the clear white pansies in a, in a large landscape bed, but they are very appropriate and very suitable, especially if you're doing something up closer to your house. That's where you can utilize a lot of these colors for that slower traffic. When you're walking up to the front of your house in containers where you can really appreciate the face of it or even some of the unique textures of it here we've got some that have a little bit of a bicolor effect to them so here you can see we have the frizzle sizzle orange and it's a really great um, detail with the ruffles around the petals but again if you were doing this um, out at the entrance of your home or something where somebody's going to see it quickly and pass by from a distance they're not going to notice that so think about some of these details and where you might utilize them in your garden more appropriately now we have another one here this is a very very dark purple you can see it is purple because of the back of it here has purple to it but it almost looks black so if we were just to plant this black pansy in our landscape without any addition of any highlight colors to it, again, as we go into winter and we don't have um, some of the other colors around it, it's just gonna kind of blend into the dirt and really not give you that impact that you might be seeking in those winter months. So think about that when you're choosing your colors. One of my favorite classic combinations is blue and orange or blue and yellow. And so we've got that here. So we're going to plant a mix of yellow and blue on the outside of our potager garden around the box with just to kind of help add some color. Um, you typically want to plant these on about a six to eight inch spacing, but we're going to more or less kind of work them in between our boxwoods. So we're going to alternate our yellow and blue on the outside. And you can see we've got the area kind of prepped. We've pulled the mulch back. Um, pansies and violas, they really don't require much care. They just prefer full sun. And of course, in the wintertime, we lose a lot of our leaves. So you might have even more space that's not traditionally full sun um, actually exposed to more sunlight. Um, and so you can see these have some good roots. We just want to plant them like we traditionally plant plants um, where the soil meets the top of our uh, garden soil that we're planting it in. They don't need a lot of heavy fertilizer. You can fertilize them if you want or kind of top dress them with a kind of a all purpose slow release fertilizer if, if you would like. Um, but we're just going to mix these in here and go back and forth with our colors. Now you might have wondered why we picked pansies instead of violas or what the difference is between the two. So the thing about pansies is typically they have a much larger flower to them. You can see as we compare here, we've got a couple of violas um, and violas come in a range of colors too. 
pansies do tend to come in more variety of colors. So if you're really looking at customizing your garden, you might go with pansies. But again, pansies have a much bolder flower. However, don't discredit the viola because violas actually tend to produce more flowers per plant. So you get really this layered effect with um, the different number of flowers that they have on them. I will say also that uh, violas tend to be a little bit more cold hardy. Um, so if you're further north and you really are concerned about that cold hardiness, um, you might take that into mind. Um, but really here in Oklahoma, both do well in our winter months. The other thing about violas is they tend to trail a little bit more. So I really like them for their daintiness um, and their sweetness that they add into the garden, especially in containers where they're gonna kind of trail over those. So putting them in, especially if you're doing a fall um, or a, a spring, early spring container where they can trail over, those make a nice addition. Now, if you're wanting to have the best of both worlds, there actually are hybrids now called panolas that are a cross between pansy and viola. Um, they're not as common to find on the market, but you can find them. And basically they have the best of both worlds. They also have numerous flowers. They are slightly larger than your traditional viola still slightly smaller than your pansy. However, they also do have that cold hardiness that the violas bring to the table. Regardless, you really kind of treat them all the same, full sun, um, you know, and uh, also moderate fertilizer. And really, if you want to keep them flowering all season long, make sure to deadhead them. Um, you might find that they do kind of slow down in those deep, cold winter months, um, but you will find that even when there's snow on the ground, that you might have a few pansies still blooming in your garden. Hello again, this is Wesley and we're back for another segment talking about winds in Oklahoma. There's definitely some variability in the wind patterns of Oklahoma throughout the year. We tend to have our heaviest or highest wind speeds in the late spring, so that would be April and May. It is not uncommon for 10 to 15 mile an hour winds on average daily during that time of year. Uh, this year, in 2022, it was an exceptionally windy spring. April came in as the windiest month on average that we have ever recorded with Oklahoma Mesonet in nearly 30 years. May also came in well above normal for average wind speeds. When we get into the summer months of later June, July, and August, the winds tend to calm down uh, and we have some of those dog days of summer where it is extremely hot. To measure the wind on our mesonet towers, we use two different devices called an anemometer. This is the larger one that sits at the top of our towers at 10 meter, or about 33 feet. So anytime you see winds on the news, you can rest assured that it came from the standard height of 33 feet tall when they report it. Winds are important for a couple of different variables. One is when we are spraying pesticides, especially herbicides, we want to avoid days when those windy conditions would carry that product offsite. So on the Oklahoma Mesonet, we have a tool called the Drift Risk Advisor that uses a forecast that will estimate when are the best hours to spray over the next three and a half days. And you can use this as a planning tool when you're putting out those herbicides to try to avoid drift on your neighbor's property or some sensitive plants like tomatoes out there. Now, in the summertime, uh, we, we would actually like to have a little better winds than we normally get in June, July, and August because that tends to uh, keep us cooler as we evapor evaporate the sweat that, that develops on our skin. But as I mentioned earlier, it tends to be a, one of the slowest wind speed times of the year. High wind speeds do contribute to something called evapotranspiration. The higher the wind speeds, the more moisture is lost from the plants and from the soil surface. So when we have those windier times, windier months, we have to be more concerned about the water that's being lost from plants 
and from ground, uh, tilled grounds and replace that water with irrigation. In the summer months, since the winds tend to be a little bit lower, it's more of a heat factor that determines how much irrigation we need to apply to the plants. Our anemometers tell us multiple things. They tell us the wind speed. Uh, we, we send that data out to subscribers uh, on an app or on the website every five minutes. But we actually take a reading every two to three seconds on the tower. That fastest two to three second reading will be the wind gust. The average of all of those readings over a five minute period will be the wind speed. And then of course, the devices like this are also able to determine wind direction. And we report that either as degrees or in uh, north, south, east, or west directional arrows. So a recap on wind speeds, the windiest time of the year on average is those spring months, April and May. The slowest wind speeds tends to be the summer months of July, August, maybe September. Then the winds tend to pick up again in the fall and over into winter. And that's when we, they start contributing towards something called wind chill on our temperature maps. Be sure to access Oklahoma Mesonet information either on an app for smartphones or on our website at mesonet.org. Our Oklahoma proven annual for 2022 is the coleus. Now coleus is a time-honored foliage plant. It's been around for decades and over the decades they've actually released hundreds of cultivars and they continue to with the breeding process and improving them. Uh, there's all kinds of leaf shapes and forms and colors. They grow from six inches tall to nice large rounded 30 inch, 36 inch bushy plants. They are just awesome. So way back um, you know, several decades ago, they actually were considered and most prized for shade for shady areas. Uh, then some some time ago, they came out with the sun coleus, and they've bred into them uh, more uh, light tolerance, so sun tolerance. And so now uh, we have dozens of cultivars that grow really well out in full sun, and they are actually one of the best foliage plants we have for Oklahoma. Now, these are plants that don't like to dry out. So it is a plant you're gonna to have to keep consistently moist throughout the summer. Um, but other than that, they're really easy to grow. Minor pest problems once in a while, um, but they're pretty tough overall. So uh, the breeders have, uh, again, like I said, they, they continue to improve, the, improve their performance. Uh, one of the things that they've kind of bred into them is, is less flowering, or later flowering because we don't typically want them to flower. So most of the time we're gonna come in and we're gonna pinch that flower out so that we can keep it nice and bushy and clean. So if you're looking for a great annual for full sun or maybe part shade, or even as an indoor house plant, coleus might be a great selection for you. everybody. There is just nothing I like better than a summer grown tomato. And one of my favorite things to make with the summer grown tomato is tomato basil bruschetta. So today I am going to show you how to make this. It is a very simple dish with just a few ingredients and minimal effort on your part as the cook. I've started with a pint of cherry tomatoes and I've quartered them. 
I like making this with cherry tomatoes because there's not a lot of liquid in a cherry tomato and you don't want so much liquid that it's going to be too runny and make your toast soggy. Um, but if you have a different type of tomato that you'd like to use that has more liquid in it, just try to remove the seeds as you go and dice your tomato. Aroma tomato also works really well. But if you have something like a hothouse or a beefsteak tomato, it's probably going to be a little bit too um, wet. So I've got my pint of cherry tomatoes. They've been quartered. And to this, I'm just going to add a little bit of salt. And a few cloves of minced garlic. I've put this through a garlic press but you could just mince it or um, turn it into a paste with the flat part of your knife if you want. And I'm also gonna add a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil, just a touch, don't overdo it, and some balsamic vinegar. Probably for a pint of tomatoes, maybe a couple of teaspoons of balsamic vinegar. It's got a very strong flavor. And so again, you don't wanna overdo it I'm going to mix all of that together. And remember, as you're making a dish like this, you can always add more, but it's hard to take out. So if you go easy on the salt, go easy on the olive oil, go easy on the balsamic vinegar, and then later when you taste it, if you think it needs a little bit more of one of those things, you can always add more. So just give it a quick stir. And then I am also going to add to this some um, basil chiffonade. And at this point, it's pretty much done. You can uh, make this and let it sit overnight. It'll um, give it a stronger garlic and, and vinegar flavor. Um, so you can make it ahead of time if you wanted. This is a crowd pleaser at a backyard barbecue. And it's so simple that you could make it just for your family on a weeknight. Now I'm going to take you through just a few serving options so that, you know, it's not just tomatoes on toast, which is our first option. You know, the most traditional way to eat this would be on toast. That's the way you're going to get it in a restaurant. You might see it listed as an appetizer. So I've just taken some Italian bread, sliced it, put a little butter on it, and put it in the broiler for a few minutes until it's toasted. You could take it a little darker in color than that if you want. It's up to you. And you just spoon a little of your tomato basil mixture right on the top and serve it like that. Another way that I like to eat it is on top of meat. It's really, really good on top of chicken and fish. So I've got a piece of salmon here that I cooked on the stove top. This would be just as good if you grilled it or um, cooked it however you like. But I cooked mine on the stove top. I'm just going to, again, spoon a little bit of the tomato basil mixture right on the top of the fish and serve it that way. It's really delicious. It really amps up whatever meat you have. Or you could eat this as a salad. So I've got some uh, a romaine uh, lettuce mix. And this kind of makes its own little oil and vinegar dressing. So if you put your tomato basil mixture right on top of your lettuce and maybe get in there and get some of the liquid spooned out that's at the bottom. So you have a little bit extra dressing on, to drizzle over the top. And to this, you could add croutons. Um, Store-bought croutons are really good nowadays. Or you could take your extra toast and chop it up as croutons or just serve it right there on the side of your salad bowl. Uh, so with this, you have three separate dishes you could serve or you can kind of make different combinations here so you could serve the fish with the toast bruschetta and a side salad or you could take your fish and cut it up and put it in your salad and you've got just uh, several possibilities here in one simple recipe i hope you enjoy <music>
There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Before your garden croaks for the season, we will show you how to preserve your annuals next week right here on Oklahoma Gardening. Orchid halo. And kind of act like you're talking and finishing up. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club. 